Let me ask you to do something this morning. Let me ask you to close your eyes. I'm not going to... I'm not going to come to you or surprise you or anything, but just close your eyes right where you're seated. And I want you to think on this for a moment. And close your eyes, just, just out of respect for the privacy of your neighbor, if, if, if nothing else. Close your eyes. And here's what I want you to think on for a moment. Think back. Think on the most poor, humble, simple home that you've ever been in here in the valley. Maybe your abuela's, maybe, maybe your grandmother's home, maybe your tia's home. Keep your eyes closed. Maybe the home you grew up in. The most humble, simple home that you've ever spent t time in. Maybe you shared a meal in that home at some point. All right, all right, now you can, you can open your eyes and, and you can look up. This is Bridget. You know Bridget. Bridget's a friend of mine. We're, we've been in a gospel community together the last, what, year? Yes. On Saturday nights uh, prior to our Community Matters uh, Wednesday night meetings. Before that, uh, for about a year, we, with our families and several other families we've been, some of you, we've been in a, a gospel community, like a small group, a gospel community that is, has met on Saturday nights. So I've gotten to know Bridget a little better, and Bridget's gotten to know me a little better, and we're both still friends, so that's a good sign. Um, Bridget uh, works, spends time working at um, the Good Neighbor Settlement House in, um, here in Brownsville. And uh, so I have some questions I want to ask you. You know what they are. Uh, they're simple questions. First question, uh, in relation to your time that you spent working at the Good Neighbor, neighbor, good neighbor Settlement House, uh, what is the first thing that you would want to tell us about the poor? Hi. Okay. The first thing I would really want to say is just that there are people just like us. They might have no income or lower incomes, unstable living situations, but they're resilient, hopeful, and they're really just like us. Good. Now, before I go on, can you, every word that she speaks is important. Can you all hear her out there? Yep. Yes. Lean into that mic, okay? okay. <laughs> they're just like us. They're just like you and me. Yeah. We, in life in general, we, we kind of hate to hear that about, pe like, when we look at people and they're like, oh, they're just like us, because it makes us feel like, oh, I'm not anything special. Like, I thought I was better than everybody. But then you hear the message that uh, they're just like you. And it's, it's truth. Well, question number two, what is your favorite thing about working at the Good Neighbor Settlement House? Well, there's a lot of things I love about working there. Well, first, the people that I work with also have great hearts. but. Just the fact to uh, give back, and uh, when you hand them the hot meal, just see their faces and like how grateful they are. And uh, sometimes, even for me, it just surprises me because uh, I sometimes take that for granted that we have a hot meal every night. So, yeah, for, it's been a joy for Ly Lydia, my, my wife, and I on Saturday nights to hear some of your stories about your, your time working at Good Neighbor Southern House. You've, you come in with, with stories of, that, that I, can, I can see or I can hear the, the joy in your, yeah. in your stories. Uh, next question. What is the most interesting person, or who is the most interesting person that you've met at the Settlement House? I've met a lot of interesting people since working there. Um, that was a hard one. But I'd say uh, this elderly gentleman, he was a vet, a veteran. And um, he lives in his truck. And even though he lives in his truck and he's bound to a wheelchair, he's always smiling. He has great stories and just always makes me laugh. And uh, I could tell that the younger men really looked up to him. And uh, they would even go get his plates for him and just to see that, like, bond. But he was just a special guy. I really liked him. Okay. Last question. You've made it. Bridget was really nervous. But <laughs> you've, you've made it. The last question. Tell us what you did on your last birthday. 
Okay, so my birthday, I just wanted to do two things. Really, I just wanted to spend it with my family, but I also wanted to give back, do something a little bit different. So instead of getting a cake and all that, uh, Ricky, Emily, and I went and we bought a bunch of cupcakes. I couldn't remember how many, it was a lot. And uh, we had a little bit of money left over to that month. So we went and got a bunch of ones cashed out and we went down there on a Saturday and um, just gave out a cupcake and a dollar to each of them. And it was honestly the best birthday I'd ever had. It gave me so much joy and such a blessing. And even though it was like just a cupcake and a dollar, it was just so, they were so thankful, so. May I pray for you? Yes. God, I thank you for Bridget. God, I pray for many more years of, of, of fruitfulness in her ministry and her representing you. And God, I pray that we as a church, we as a people would learn from her. We would learn from her ways. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Let me walk you down. Okay. The poor and the simple in our community, they matter. We, we're going through this, this series, Community Matters. And today our take on it, today the, the, the edge or the, the direction is that, that as our community matters, specifically what we look at today is the poor and the simple in our community matters. Mrs. Jones uh, was quoted in, in a book uh, called Total Church by Steve Timmis and Tim Chester. I've been really ingesting this book over the last few months. I, I started reading it in the summer and uh, read it quickly, but I've continued to reread it. Um, Mrs. Jones is a mother who has lived in poverty her entire life. This is what she would want you to know about the poor. She says, in part, poverty is about having no money. We know that part of it. We, we kind of we kinda get that part. In part, poverty is about having no money. But there is more to poverty than that, she says. It's about being isolated, unsupported, uneducated, and unwanted. Poor people want to be included. <clears throat> Think about our Wednesday night gatherings, if you will. Poor people want to be included and not just judged and rescued at times of crisis. So I would ask you, who are the poor and the simple that we're talking about? Who are the poor and simple among us here in Brownsville? Who are they? And I would say that they are the people who have no say-so in matters. The people who have no voice, they have no vote, they're silent. Why do they have no vote? I mean, we, we all can go to, to the poll, we all can go and vote. Why do they have no vote? Well, it might be a simple matter like they have no car. Why do they have no voice? Because they have no platform. No one would, would even think of stopping and listening to them. Why is it that they have no say-so in matters? Because they're the people who have been marginalized. People who we push aside. People whose opinion we wouldn't even ask because we wouldn't think to value. So today we're talking about, about our church, about River Church, and, and how we see the poor and the simple in our own community. This isn't meant to be a theoretical talk. This is meant for us to really con consider how do we as a church see, view, relate to give value to the poor and the simple who live, among, who live among us, who live right here in Brownsville. Um, 
As I said, some of us get real excited about this, and I mean that in the best sense of excitement. And there are some among us who, who really engage the poor, who really, who really reach out and care for and relate to the simple. And there's some of us who, who are really intimidated by that and who, who have, I know I've done this in some ways, who we've, we've built walls and we've built barriers and we've built ways in which we, we, don't, we no longer have to deal with people who maybe we don't understand, people who confuse us. So today what we're going to do, because this is always the safe direction to go when we're talking about a controversial matter, we're going to look at what Jesus says. And fortunately, Jesus, he said a lot about this topic. He spoke, he spoke much about this issue of the poor and the simple among us. Not, did he, not only did he speak much about that topic, he engaged them. In fact, if you really, if you give an honest reading to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the four books in the Bible that really tell the stories of Jesus while he was the God-man here on earth for 33 years of his life, if you really look at the stories of Jesus, you, you, have, you, you have to come to the conclusion that he spent most of his time engaging the poor and the simple and the broken and the sick, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the forgotten, the picked upon. He spent a great, the greatest percentage of his life relating to those people. And, and so we don't have to wonder Jesus' take on this matter. He spoke very clearly several places, in fact, numerous places in the gospel. We're going to camp out on just one chapter in the gospel of Luke today. And we're going to look at just one Saturday in the life of Jesus. I don't know what you did yesterday. Um, I, I, uh, I watched some college football. I, uh, I, I went to my son's middle school football game. I, I did some cleaning up around the house. I did some relaxing. I spent several hours getting ready to preach. I don't know what you did on a Saturday. But we get to look at one Saturday in the life of Jesus in which he spoke very clearly about the poor, the outcast, the damaged, the unclean among us. So that's what we're going to look at today. <clears throat> Luke chapter 14. One Sabbath. Now what day of the week is that? That's, that's Saturday. <clears throat> and in, in Jewish tradition, that was their Sunday. What we see as Sunday, the going to church day, uh, that, was their, that was their Sunday. Sabbath, Saturday. They're, they're going to church today. They're going to church day. They would... They would go to uh, the, the synagogue. They would, uh, they would commit an entire 24 hours to the Lord in which they would change their habits and their patterns and their eating and their work and their play and, and everything was committed to the Lord. So one Sabbath when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, it says they were watching him carefully. If that sounds a little creepy to you, it should. I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the, of the Pharisees, and, and they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. That sounds like a terrible disease, right? And I'll explain to you in a moment what that is. Uh, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying... Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, this religious holiday, or not? <clears throat> but they remained silent. Then he took him, this man with the dropsy, and he healed him, and then he sent him away. And he, Jesus, said to them, the, the guests, the invited guests at the dinner party, which of you having a son or an ox, think like a cow, 
that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, a religious holiday, will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. They were rendered speechless. They did not know how to respond. So what's going on here? Uh, Jesus heals a man with dropsy, and he does it on a religious holiday, and he, he does this healing, he performs this healing at a dinner party at the home of a very prominent man, a leader, a lawyer, a, a Pharisee, a respected man. A little history. Jesus, in that day, was called a rabbi. That means a respected teacher. They had different traditions, of course, than we have now. Um, in that day, the, the respected teacher um, would amass for himself <clears throat> a, a small group of students. And those students would, uh, would attend to his needs, would, would care for his, uh, his, his feeding and, 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 and all, meet all of his needs, and, and, he, and they would follow him and spend 24-7 with him, and he would, for a season, teach them, and they would travel together. And so he was their rabbi, and so Jesus was considered a rabbi. In fact, you remember early on in his life, they would say things like, how does this uneducated person know so much? He had, he had amassed a, a great respect, um, a, a, a great general respect as a teacher, even though he was not considered a formally educated person. And so he was a rabbi, and, and so in the, history, in the tradition of the day, uh, a rabbi, if he came to town, he would be invited perhaps to speak at your synagogue. And then what would the polite thing be uh, to do? Uh, it would be to take him home, to take the <coughs> rabbi, the visiting rabbi, he would teach, and then maybe you would take him home. Maybe one of the most prominent members would take him home for dinner. And they would invite some of the church people over, the synagogue people over, and they would honor him with a fine meal. So that would have been the tradition of the day in any community. And remember it says they were watching him. They were watching him carefully. As he was to dine at the house of a wealthy man with prominent people, invited guests only, um, he was being closely watched. <clears throat> so Jesus heals a man with dropsy. What is dropsy? <clears throat> we don't know exactly, but generally the understanding is that it was the, 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 the swelling uh, of the arms and the legs. In fact, think, think like hugely swollen limbs, um, which most likely, the most, the most common understanding of this, of this disease is that, that uh, there is something like congestive heart failure, uh, uh, so edema. And so the heart's not functioning well, so the fluids of the body aren't moving well, and so you've got these hugely swollen arms and, and limbs. And the story begs the question, which, which it doesn't answer, was this man an intruder? Um, was, he, was he a guest? Uh, maybe he was a plant. Maybe it was a setup. In that they were watching him carefully. They were watching him. They were scrutinizing Jesus' move. Perhaps this was a plant, a setup, a test. I don't know. I'm convinced that he wasn't an invited guest. He was at, at the very least an intruder because what does it say? After Jesus healed him, he sent him away. Leads me to believe he was not invited. He was unwelcome. He was, he was a bother at least. So then Jesus heals him and then he asks these elite folk who had been invited to the party a series of questions basically daring them to condemn him. Uh, if that's confusing to you, what I mean by that is he was, uh, he was doing work, they would have called it. He was healing on the Sabbath. 
They were super religious folks. They were following all these separate laws and feeling really good about themselves for following the laws. And one of the laws was, we'll do no work on the Sabbath. And it made them feel smug and self-righteous. And here Jesus is healing on the Sabbath, which they would have called work. And so he dares them to condemn him for healing on a religious holiday, and they're left speechless. Back to the story. He tells the elites, um, Jesus tells the elites a, a, a story, like a parable. You remember what a parable is? A parable is a story meant to teach a deeper meaning. Same, same party, same host, same guests, <clears throat> and, uh, and, 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 and Jesus tells this story. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, Jesus gave them this advice. <clears throat> when you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? And the host will come and say, give this person your seat. Imagine the embarrassment. <clears throat> then you'll be embarrassed and you will have to talk or take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, when you go to the wedding party, the wedding feast, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. <coughs> Oops. Then, when your host sees you, he will come and say, Friend, we, we, have, a, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. So what's Jesus saying here? Jesus is, ge is giving solid advice. This is, this is real talk, they would say. He is giving you some sound, practical advice. If you hold to the tenets of Christianity, if you hold to the teachings of Jesus, if you are uh, organizing your life according to the system, the kingdom of God, Jesus' teachings, if that is you, then Jesus is giving sound, practical advice in light of what I'm going to call today the upside-down kingdom of God. I didn't coin that phrase. I'm not sure who did, but... The upside-down kingdom of God. See, if you live in, in the right-side-up kingdom of this world, then Jesus' teaching here makes no sense, and you would not be advised to follow it. But if you are living in the kingdom of God, if you claim to be a Christ follower, then, then God's kingdom is this upside-down sort of kingdom, and Jesus gives you counsel, advice, instructions based on that. Here's what I mean by God's upside-down kingdom. In God's kingdom, there is a coming day of reversals when the first shall be last and the last shall be first. In God's upside-down kingdom, in God's coming kingdom, the one day that's not quite here yet, what happens is there's this reversal, this, this, this turning upside-down of the kingdom in which, which everyone who went last for, for all their lives, uh, for 70, 80, 90 years, they were, the, they were the last. They were the simplest. In this coming kingdom of God, this reversal of roles, the the, the last become first, and, 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 and in this one day but not yet coming kingdom of God, the first shall be last. Now that troubles us. And you and I could talk for an hour, do a QA and a about how that's not fair, or how that doesn't seem to fit with, uh, within our religious system. 
We could give countless reasons as to why that must not be what Jesus is saying. But the thing is, he said it so many times and in so many ways that we have to take it as true. In God's system, there are those of us who receive our reward on earth. And in contrast, in God's system, there are those who, who, they, who delay the pay who delay the payout. And, and, and those, those of us who delay the payout, uh, one day, instead, one day, we will be re rewarded in heaven. But here's the key for eternity. Matthew 20 is another place where Jesus made it really clear. He said, so the last will be first and the first last. And then he says this. These are Jesus' words, so I don't have to defend them. Jesus does. He says this. He says, whoever would be great among you must be a servant. And whoever would be first among you must become a slave. So Jesus is cautioning us, me, as a leader, as a person who thinks I have some, some level of importance. And he's cautioning you as, as a professional, as, as the well-adjusted. He's cautioning us. He's saying, he's, he's cautioning us against mindlessly taking the seat of honor. Which most, most of us probably do without even thinking about it. Without even realizing we're doing so. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm calling you, if you are the first, I'm calling you to go last. If you are the, 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 the master, I'm calling you to now be the servant. And he's saying, I'm calling you to do that, not because I hate you, but because I love you. Not because I want the worst for you, but because I want the best for you. He's saying this is the best thing you can do for yourself, is to become the lowly, to become the least of these, to become the servant, to become the last. Because he's saying, again, there are those of us who will receive our pay, our just reward on this earth. We're going to front end load all, all, of the, all of the good and all the fame and all the fortune but then it comes to an end. And then there are those of us who will wisely, in God's kingdom, back end load our reward. And we will receive it for eternity in heaven. And put that way, that seems like a much better deal, doesn't it? I was thinking about this concept today of, of front end loading uh, your reward here on earth. The accolades, the praise of men, and, and, and all the all of the, 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 the financial war, reward and all of the gain of being a player and how that is, that is a reward. I, do, I would like that stuff. But I was thinking of, of that in light of, 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 of a person who sets up his life and lives his life so that his reward, his gain is great in heaven for eternity. And I thought about football. There are some characters, in fact, a couple of the, I'll mention two of the greatest um, college football players in the history of the game. And they're both, they're both Longhorns, they're both, they're both U U UT uh, players. And one is Vince Young and the other is Ricky Williams. And if you study their lives, if you study uh, how they, uh, and really, Perhaps it was done to them. Perhaps it wasn't even their fault. But, but they, they, they were, uh, they were important people, important men. In fact, if we just talk about Vince Young, I'm sorry if you don't like football and you're totally bored by this analogy, but it, it works so well. Uh, Vince Young, I would consider the greatest college quarterback to ever play the game. And I don't know if you if you disagree, I'd like to hear from you afterwards. I'm not saying he's the greatest quarterback in the NFL, but the greatest, maybe the greatest athlete 
in the history of, of the NCAA, of NCAA college. And, and he, if you look his story, go, go, go study him later. He, he had, he, he, he had a, a great college career. He made a little money in the NFL. But then he burned out quickly. And today, he's, he's, not, he's, he's still a young man. And he's, he's barely scraping by. Run-ins with the law and, and financial, financial problems. And, and he front-end loaded. Maybe it wasn't his fault, but he front-end loaded his life. And, and when I hear s- stories about men like, like Vince Young and, and Ricky Williams and, and Reggie Bush and, and, and other NFL players who, I mean, they made a lot of money, but, but like their best years are behind them. And Jesus is warning us, if you're not careful, if you live according to the system of the world, you may set up your life such that your best years are behind you. Jesus is giving us sound counsel as to how we might back and load our lives for eternal reward, for eternal gain. Let's continue. Jesus just won't relent. He's that way, isn't he? The Holy Spirit is that way in our lives to this day. He just keep on coming back. Jesus won't relent. He said, then Jesus turned to the host. Man, if you're going to pick out somebody to party, don't pick at the host, right? You pick on the host. And he says, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet... Don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. Well, gosh, I mean, that's, that's, those are the only people I invite. Who am I, I going to invite? When you put on a, a party, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. Why? For they will invite you back. And that will be your only reward. Instead, Jesus says, instead invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, the coming kingdom of God, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Again, same teaching. Jesus gives us sound advice. This is not theoretical not meant to be. Uh, this, is, this is not meant to be uh, self-deprecating. Just d- 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 don't think of, uh, don't, don't, don't work for your best interest. Don't think of what might be good for you. No, quite the opposite. Jesus said, this is the best thing you can do for yourself in light of the upside-down kingdom of God. He says this, hang out with the poor, and the crippled, and the lame, and the blind. And I would say, well, like, that sounds like a party I want to go to. But Jesus says, you do that. You hang out with those people, and you will one day be rewarded, repaid at what he calls the resurrection of the just. Literally, not figuratively, literally, Jesus is saying, don't invite your friends. And why? I mean, this is crazy. We, we ha- there has to be a reason or else we're not even going to consider not inviting our friends. Jesus gives us a reason. He says, because they will invite you back. And you'll get your, your reward now. Jesus says, instead... Invite those who can't repay you now, and great will be your reward in heaven and for eternity. Great will be your reward. Do you understand what Jesus is doing here? He's saying quite literally, in light of the coming kingdom of God, in light of this upside down eternal kingdom of God, you should think twice about how you, uh, how you evaluate your place of honor, your position of power, 
in this world. He's, he's talking in a very plain fashion here. We make this complex and theoretical and symbolic because if we take it literally, it's just too challenging. Finally, let's wrap up our reading. After all this talk, there's, there's always somebody in the crowd like this. After all this talk, um, hearing this, like I would have been stunned to silence. I would have been like climbing under the table. I would have been feeling bad for the host. You know, I'd be th thankful that I'm not the host because Jesus just owned him. Hey, hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus ex exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Like he just, did you hear anything I just said? I'll tell you a story. One time uh, a person sent me a, a word of appreciation regarding the sermon that I preached that week. <clears throat> it's, it's not, nobody here, none of you would do this. Uh, send, me a, send me this nice appreciation. And, and I, I mean, it was nice, and I appreciated it. Uh, I appreciated their appreciation. And, um, and it was the only time this person had ever, never before, never since, had this person, has, has this person um, um, complimented me on my preaching, okay? But here's the weird thing. I'll never, it was, it was a sermon that was so hard for me to preach because the entire sermon uh, was, I preached on God's judgment and wrath and hell. And I thought if there, if, if there's ever a time when I didn't want to be complimented on my sermon, it was when I'm preaching on wrath and hell and God's judgment. And I had to think, did you hear anything that I said. Um, Jesus must have had that same feeling here when the man jumps up and is exclaiming something that just does not seem to fit the story. Verse 12, 16, Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. And when the banquet was, was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. <clears throat> but they all began making excuses. One said, I just bought a field and I must go and inspect it. Please excuse me. Uh, another one said, I have bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. And another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they said, and his master was furious. His master was furious, and he said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Do those words sound familiar? After the servant had done this, what he'd been told, he reported, he reported to the master, there is still room for more in the banquet. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. The word of the Lord. Now understand this. The man hosting the feast in this story, the master of the banquet in this story is God. Imagine that God invites you to a banquet and you come up with lame excuses because you don't want to go. Like I just bought a four-wheeler and I got to go try it out. 
I planned a family vacation so I can't be there. Imagine that. God invites you to a banquet, but you don't want to go. I'm too busy. And I would like to say, and we would all like to say, I wouldn't do that. Like if, if I mean, surely I wouldn't do that. Like, like, Tell me I wouldn't do that. I'm gonna t let's make each other feel good about each other. Let, let's, let's, we wouldn't do that, right? Like if God rented out the Civic Center, Friendship Gardens, if that's still a thing, and, 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 uh, and through a banquet, like surely, like he invited us, surely we would go, right? Surely we would go. And yet Jesus cautions us. Jesus is plainly warning us that we are in danger of skipping God's eternal banquet. And how are we in danger of this? How could we even consider skipping God's eternal banquet? Well, in these verses that I just read, Jesus tells this parable to teach us that the love of this world money and possessions and prosperity and security and work and investments play and leisure and boats and four-wheelers. The love of this world can keep a person out of the kingdom of heaven. And what's sad is, for a time, those that miss out don't even realize what they're missing. What's most surprising about this story, and I don't even like it, and I would take it out of Scripture if I could. What's most surprising is that in, in the place of those who didn't care to go, in their place, God substitutes the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. They're welcome in the place of the prosperous. The kingdom of God is rewarded to the outcasts and the unlikeliest of folks and it is taken away from the prosperous and the powerful in this world. That's the story Jesus tells. So the summary of all of this is that Jesus repeatedly, repeatedly gives his attention to the poor and to the marginalized, and to the outcast, to the point that he even earns himself a nickname. The religious, those who didn't break the rules, those who followed the letter of the law, even when their heart was cold and hard, those religious do-gooders, they gave Jesus the nickname, the one who eats with sinners and tax collectors. So, so today we're talking about how we as a church engage the poor, the simple, who live among us. And listen, I, I mean this sincerely and I, I, I don't even, I don't mean it sarcastically. You, you do not need to come to me afterwards with this thought. Well, Randy, the rich and successful people need Jesus too. I fully realize that. I, I, I fully believe in God, by God's standards, we are, we are the rich and the successful. Boy, do we need Jesus. I, I realize that. But here's the thought. 
Here's a thought. What if, what if the best thing that we can do for the wealthy and the successful among us, which really is us, what if the best thing that we can do for the wealthy, the successful, what if, what if the best thing we can do is care for, evangelize the poor and the needy? Here's what I mean. The rich, the successful, the well-adjusted, the, the, the us. Um, we need to be drawn away from our preoccupation with power and success and stuff and the kingdom of this world. And, and, and the way that we do that, the way that we, we draw the rich and the successful and the powerful among us away from the allure of this world, the way that we draw them, us, away from it is by displaying for them the teachings of Jesus. A love for the poor and a love for the needy and a love for going ra last rather than going first and a love for being the servant rather than the master. And because what it does is it exposes self-righteousness and it, it exposes selfishness. Eating with the unlovely. Spending time with the damaged. Hanging out with the outcasts. What it does is it exposes the yuck in my heart. It exposes my own self-righteousness. And it, it lays me low. Which is exactly where Jesus invites us to be. So I'm just struck by the question... I'm not even sure I know the answer to the question. How we as a church, how we might build a community of faith where the poor and the marginalized and the simple live among us. They are us. We are them. But let's stop for a moment and let's pray. I'm not done preaching, but let's stop and pray. God, God, would you, this is real stuff. This is not, this is not play. This is not trivial. This is not something that we should piddle at. This is, this is a serious teaching of Jesus. God, would you, we pray this with some fear and some trembling. Would you teach us how to, how do we do this? We pray this in Christ's name, amen. So Jesus prioritizes the poor. And by doing, in doing so, in doing so, Jesus is called a, a, a drunkard and a, and, and a glutton and a, and, a, and a friend of sinners. Why? Because he loved, because of his love for the outcast, outcast, because of his love for those who would be considered damaged goods. What do the poor and the simple among us need? They need a friend who will eat and drink and sit a while with them. The best thing that we can do for the poor and the marginalized is offer them a, a place of welcome, offer them a place of community. Robert Chambers, um, I believe he's a British author, he, he, he says this, the, the five mutually reinforcing factors of poverty. And I put this stuff up on the screen because I feel like, like we're not even quite sure like what we're talking about. Like we live such privileged lives. We live such privileged lives. And the lack of, uh, the five mutually reinforcing factors to poverty want to be a lack of resources. We kind of get that. A physical weakness. Isolation, powerlessness, and vulnerability. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people here in the valley that have been here for generations. People who were powerless and vulnerable and isolated. And they'll, they'll, they will, they will fix your flat or, 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 or mow your lawn or clean your house for way less money than they probably ought to be charging. Why? Because they're vulnerable. They're isolated. They're powerless. 
it would be profitable for us as a church to realize how perhaps we culturally are shaped socially, what sort of class we fit in. Are, are there unwritten dress codes that we have? Or, or is there, are there finances attached to our get-togethers that maybe cause some people to feel uncomfortable? Jesus hung out with the unrespectable people. And, 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 and people complained about that. And if we, if we really welcomed and invited the, the unrespectable here to our gatherings, I suspect some of us would complain about it too. Would we consider, would we consider planting a church, planting a church as River, as River Church, would we, would we consider planting a church in the poorest neighborhoods in Brownsville? In the, in the rural poor areas, in the rural urban areas of Brownsville and Cameron County, would we consider that? Or would we say, no, it really ought to be in North Brownsville? I'm not saying that, we, that, we, that we, we should. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. I'm just saying, would we consider it? Would we be open to it? What is our perspective? Listen, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this passage. God, God has told us that his plan to build churches is a plan that starts with simple, humble, ordinary, non-flashy people because it puts on display God's grace. We tend to think, and you read any church planting book, you look at any church planting model, it will tell you this, you want to start with the, the best of people. You want to start with the most charismatic of people. You want to start with the, well, the most well-adjusted people. And in my mindset, because I have one foot in this world, my mindset is the same. That is how you start a church. But God said quite the opposite in Paul's writings. We'll look at it. God said that his strategy has always been to choose the weak and the foolish and the simple people of the, this world as his own, thus magnifying his glory, magnifying the glory of what Jesus has done on the cross. People would say, like, that little church there uh, made up a bunch of nothing people. That must be God. Paul said this, for consider your calling, brothers. He's talking to the church in Corinth. Um, not many of you were wise according to the world's standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in this world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast not in himself, but in the Lord. Now, I don't even necessarily, I've struggled with this all this week, this week. I don't even necessarily know how to land this plane because I, I don't know where this takes us as a church. But here's where I think we need to go next. And that is Wednesday night in our, in our, in our community night at our tables. We're breaking up into smaller tables now. I, need, I think we need to start like brainstorming and dialoguing and thinking through in light of this radical teaching of Jesus, how, how might we infuse this into the life and work and ministry of River Church? How might we align ourselves with the teachings of Jesus as a church? And so come Wednesday night with ideas and, and passion and, and arguments and, and let's, let's really dialogue. Let's really talk about this on Wednesday night at, at, at 6.45. Let's pray.